Hello, everybody. I'm Rita Reimers, your host of 19 Cats and Counting. Oh, we have somebody extra special today, the kitten lady, Hannah Shaw. I've been a longtime admirer of Hannah's. We're going to take a very brief break from our sponsors, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to 19 Cats and Counting with today's extra special guest, kitten lady herself, Hannah Shaw. Welcome to the show, Hannah. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. I so admire everything you do for the kittens out there. It, it really takes a very special talent to uh, take care of those little ones, especially special needs. How did you get started with this? Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I got started... I think like a lot of people do in rescue, um, cats found me. I uh, was about 21 years old. I was already really involved in animal advocacy, wow. but not, not with cats specifically. Uh -huh. um, and I was living in Philadelphia. I found a kitten in a tree of all places. And um, yeah, I just, I. I had no idea that kittens were such a vulnerable population. You know, mm -hmm. like I said, I was already involved in animal advocacy uh, with other animals, but I always thought kittens, cats probably had it pretty good. Uh, and then I very quickly learned that actually orphaned kittens are an extremely at-risk population. Right. They do not have great outcomes in animal shelters, especially, you know, 11 years ago when I was getting started. Um, so, you know, it just kind of went from there. I ended up adopting that cat. That's my cat, Coco. Aww. Um, and then, you know, a couple weeks later, I found another kitten outside and I was like, is this just my life now? Like, what is <laughs> and then it just continued like that. The first, I would say dozen to two dozen kittens that I rescued were all just ones that I found outside, mm -hmm. you know, um, Philadelphia, 11 years ago, you could just kind of go outside and, find, you know, there were cats everywhere. And, hey, I want a cat. I'm just going to go outside, right? You know, and so I would find them. I would, you know, I learned a lot just through the, that experience about taking care of orphans and helping place them in adoptive homes. And then mm. from there, I ended up, um, I ended up moving to North Carolina. I had a friend who ran an animal rescue down there and she said, you know, we could really use more people down here doing this because the shelter system was very broken at this oh, time. I know. I mm -hmm. to go mm -hmm. in North Carolina. Um, so when I moved to North Carolina 10 years ago is when I started getting involved more in shelters and it just broke my heart in a way that I don't think I'll ever recover from. And I'm spending the rest of my and life no. trying to fix it. So that's how well, I got Are you still in the Carolinas? I'm just outside Charlotte, North Carolina. So oh. I know how broken the system is. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I have since moved, I have since moved a couple times, but I live in San Diego, California now where it's beautiful kitten season year round. Um, no. But I lived in North Carolina for several years. That's really where all of my kind of, understanding of the sheltering system developed and where my love for working with um, shelters, specifically like sh shelters with a lot of need, like rural shelters, that was where I became very passionate about that. Because yeah. as I'm sure you know, 10 years ago in North Carolina, I mean, cats, even healthy adult cats, much less like young, you know, special needs kittens, they did not have good outcomes in shelters. And mm -hmm. um, really the only opportunity to help was, you know, to go and get them and bring them home and foster them and find them a loving placement. And that was how I became so passionate about um, trying to get other people to foster because sure. I realized really quickly that, you know, I was not going to be able to do it all alone. So. No. That's the problem is there's so many, and especially like you mentioned in the warm climates like the Carolinas in California, um, there's not a break. Up north, you know, in the winter, you can't find kittens, but down right. here, all year round. And um, I, first, I first got introduced to the shelter system in Los Angeles. Oh, yeah. And then when I moved back here, um, it's better than it was 10 years ago, but not that much because there's so, you know, all the improvements they make, there's just so many out there. It doesn't matter, you know, how much bigger, how much better, how many fosters, there's always the need for more. Yeah, I know. I completely agree with that. I mean, a story I can share is the the shelter that kind of broke my heart 10 years ago was um, 
was a very small rural shelter in North Carolina. And um, I used to go there and just, I would just go there and cry. I would stand in the parking lot and cry yeah. and try to, try to figure out like, okay, how many can I really take? How many people can I find to agree to take, you know, a couple kittens? Like, what can I do? <laughs> and that animal shelter still was euthanizing with a gas chamber. And at the time, <gasps> oh. there were there were about a dozen in the state that were doing that. And it was just so, um, it was just so hard for me as like a young person who loved animals to see it just kind of on display there. Like there's the gas chamber, like this just like looming threat. And so I, I would just go there and I would just weep and try to figure out what to do. And And the beautiful thing that I can say about the way that North Carolina has changed since that time mm -hmm. is, you know, gas chambers have been outlawed. Right. Live outcomes are just going up and up every single year. And a couple years ago, I was fortunate enough to be able to go back to that shelter um, and give a talk, um, you know, go there and, and give a, a, a training. And what I saw was they got a new director who had gotten a completely new building and he had done a fundraiser where you could pay like a donation for the new building. And then that donation gave you the ability to be part of smashing and destroying the gas chamber. <gasps> I love that. It was oh. just like, so I like, I cried even just hearing about that because mm -hmm. I was like, that is just so like powerful. So, you know, I, I have to say you, it's, it's very heartening to be part of it. Like, you know, in the, like, for a long time because you get to see really like the the transition that's happening and mm -hmm. and that makes it all the more important to be in, involved so that you know 10 years from now we can look back and go oh my gosh remember 10 years ago i know um lancaster county south carolina that's where i am just 30 miles south of charlotte they're in the middle of uh building a brand new facility i think it's just about ready to open and they have two cat rooms, but what they've also done is they've partnered with a um, pet store here in Lancaster. Lancaster is very small. Um, that has, they take the kittens and, you know, they have them in the store. Because so many people, it's hard for them to walk, me included, to walk into a shelter and know that, you know, the choice you make is truly life and death. Um, how do you help people understand that, that is really where the need is. Rescues, it's great to adopt from rescues because they can pull from shelters too, but going into the shelters is where you're going to have the most impact on saving a life. Well, I think that, you know, yeah, you make a good point. If you want to directly be like you went and, you know, saved a life, like definitely going to a shelter is a great way to help. But I do think that, um, you know, no matter where you're adopting from, you're helping someone because- For sure space for more cats to be, you know, taken into that rescue. I'm a big fan of things like the PetSmart Charities Adoption yes. Centers where you can like go in and, and that for some people is much more comfortable, you know, yeah. even like a cat cafe. I, for example, my friends um, who run the Catcade in um, Chicago, I recently interviewed them for the um, interview series that I'm doing called Kitten uh -huh. Lake and Friends. And, uh, you know, you go adopt from there and you feel like you're at this cool like cat cafe with like arcade games and stuff but every cat in there is pulled from like some of the most rural shelters in Kentucky they they get the cats from and so every single cat that is adopted from this like cool arcade is opening <laughs> space in that shelter in Kentucky so there's a lot of interesting things going on where you can adopt you know from whatever type of environment is comfortable for you. But I would tell people, don't be scared to go to an animal shelter to adopt. I mean, shelters are, um, you know, filled with people who are doing the best they can with the resources right. that they have. And I think it's important for us to, um, to remember that. And especially in those shelters that maybe don't have the best reputation in the community, it's right. even more important to involve yourself and involve yourself in a compassionate way, not in a judgmental way, you know, Absolutely. like show up, show up and be like, what can I do? You know, do you, whether you're an adopter, whether you want to foster, whether you want to, you know, volunteer or drop off some supplies, like mm -hmm. what, what the animal sheltering world and what animal welfare needs is just more hands on deck, compassionately showing up in a non-judgmental way, just right. really to help.
my fear of walking into a shelter as I usually end up taking one home. But I'm full now. 19 cats and counting. I'm actually at 20 now. I just uh, rescued a kitty this week with the help of another rescue organization. Wow. Um, turned out we thought it was a kitten, but he was just so small and malnourished. He's 12 years old. Oh my um, gosh. Yeah, but he's in my cat room recovering right now. My other kitties are peeking in. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I do plan to uh, volunteer at that new shelter as soon as it's open. My mom runs the Humane Society here, and we work very closely with uh, the Lancaster shelter. Um, I've gotten a few calls from the director. Um, we have this kitten that's three weeks old, dangly leg. We have to put her down unless you take her. Well, she's, she's here. She and her brother are here. So um, when people see cats or kittens outside, what is the best advice you can give them about whether or not to intervene? Sure. It's a really um, good and complex question um, because <laughs> the answer is it depends. Um, just because you see a cat outside does not necessarily mean that there is any intervention um, indicated. It depends on the situation. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, my perspective is always that shelters and rescue groups do not need more cats. Um, so we should not be in the business of driving around looking for cats to scoop up and stick in a cage at the shelter. <laughs> right. um, so that's my perspective. But I do think that if you see cats in your community, the first thing you want to do is look for an ear tip to see if that cat has been spayed or neutered. Mm. Um, if they have not been, then it, this, this is a call to action for you to get involved, you know, get a trap, make sure that that cat is sterilized. Um, that's the number one way that you're going to be able to help. You can make a lasting impact like that. Um, now, if you see kittens outside, it all depends on, again, the situation. How old are they? Um, are they old enough to be separated from mom or do they need their mom for nursing? Um, you know, are they uh, a six month old feral kitten who's you know, wants nothing to do with you? Or are they like a six week old kitten who could really easily be socialized? Um, you know, it really depends. I have a, um, a webinar that I did. I did this um, wonderful uh, webinar series with Royal Canaan um, called the Catology Kitten Care Webinar Series. And um, I highly recommend that people watch that if they're interested in learning more. There's it's a four part webinar series. And the fourth one is called Feral Felines and Helping Kittens Found Outdoors. So it's like a two hour webinar. I can't answer in like five minutes what I could answer in two hours on that. So <laughs> I'm I gonna say, check that out. Yeah, if you really wanna learn about helping cats and kittens outside, I would watch, um, watch the Feral Felines webinar that I did. Um, so, yeah, but the, the quick answer is it really depends. And and the answer may not be to scoop up the animal and bring them to the shelter, or it may be. It really, really depends on the situation. Right. Um, I developed a method for shelters to help the public understand what to do, because so often you either hear like one extreme or the other shelters will say like, oh, just bring them in or don't bring them in. Like if you see a kitten outside, just leave them there. And the answer is actually somewhere much more nuanced than that, you know? Sure. So this method that I came up with, I call the CASA method and it's like C-A-S-A, -S -A, the four things that you should be thinking about when you're talking to someone it. who's found a kitten outside. Right. And the things you should be thinking about are C is for condition. So what condition is the animal in? Are they currently suffering in a way that requires that they come in right. or do they look like they're in great condition? Because if they look like they're in great condition, then they definitely are being cared for, you know, by a mom or by right. somebody in the neighborhood, you know. Um, a is um, their age. So it's important to know what age they are because that's going to tell you, do they need to be with mom? Do they, if they don't have a mom, are they going to require, you know, care? Can they be socialized? S is the situation. So are they in a safe situation? Or are they in an unsafe situation? Obviously, we're going to be more likely to intervene if they're in a very unsafe place versus, right. you know, in a place where they have shelter or they have a feeder or things like that. And then um, the second A is abilities. So what do you personally have the ability to do? You know, if you personally want to scoop up a kitten and foster them, then you know, that's great, but, but you want to be thinking about your abilities. If you don't have that ability, then you want to think, okay, 
does the shelter have the capacity to help this kitten or might it be better to leave them in the field with the mom and you know come back and make sure everybody's spayed and neutered later and scoop them up once they can be socialized so it's a very complex (laughs) it's a very complex thing and you know this is the kind of stuff in animal welfare i think sometimes we're looking for like a quick like a one sentence answer to what's the answer yeah yeah and and unfortunately you know, so much of animal welfare is nuanced. And so I think it's important that we have those conversations. And I think that the public, you know, the public is is intelligent enough to be able to understand as long as we're explaining to them. I love that that information's out there now. And I will definitely uh, promote that on my website and my blog, because I'm thinking back, I mostly take in adults, but I have taken in kittens. And most of the kittens I've taken in have been way young, like between three and five weeks. Mm-hmm. And that is too young for them to be away from mom. Sure. So sometimes I wonder if good Samaritans are a little fast to snatch up the kittens thinking they're doing a good thing and forgetting there's a mom out there now looking for those kittens, right? Yes. Yeah. I have a perfect example right now. I have um, five foster kittens who came here as orphans. And then we were able to find the mom. Oh, and good. So we were able to reunite them together. Mm-hmm. And, and I try to share these stories as often as possible because I think a lot of people assume that kittens are orphaned when actually most of the time they come from community cats. And a lot of people don't even think like that. Like they sure. find a kitten outside, they go, oh, some horrible person put them here. And I'm like, I mean, the good news is there's not that many horrible people putting kittens outside. There really Thankfully, aren't. Right. The bad news is, there's a lot of unsterilized community cats who are yes. kittens outside, you know, so that's typically where kittens are coming from. I definitely am all for TNR. Um, do you get involved in, in talking about that a lot during of your Of course, talks? yeah. I mean, yeah. I, run a, I run a TNR program here in San Diego. We have our full circle program. So um, I founded a nonprofit called Orphan Kitten Club. Um, and you can find out about it at orphankittenclub.org. Um, but we have, you know, a variety of programs, including like a nursery program. We also have our, our TNR program, which is where we, we make a promise to every kitten in our care that we will go back out and actually sterilize the entire colony. So um, I love that. we do even more of that than we do kitten care. Honestly, for every kitten <laughs> I rescue, I, we trap like, you know, 20 cats or something. Right. Um, and then we also have a grant program um, where we support uh, partner groups all over the country in their efforts to save kittens. So I've seen videos of your, you and your kittens in your cat room. How many kittens do you have right now or at any given time? So, um, you know, at any given time, I could have anywhere from one really difficult case to <laughs> like 15 different kittens. Um, I, because of the population I work with is so vulnerable, I, I really try not to take on more than I can actually do sure, well. Sure. Um, so, yeah. So, we, the other thing is I, I don't just do kittens. I do babies of different species. So, currently, I have... Um, Hmm. I have nine fosters, but three of them are ducklings. Um, oh, I love them. They're so uh, cute. How does so, a duckling end up in rescue? I'm curious. Yeah. Well, it's horrible. Honestly, they they end up in rescue because um, you know people people use ducklings for all sorts of horrible stuff that I don't know if you want to get into, but probably not. <laughs> um, yeah, but but um, these specific ones, um, I have, they're from two different places. One huh. came in um, to a wildlife center, and then the other two were part of a school project, which I just, uh, oh, I just oh, don't like oh, that at all. Oh, no. You know, people are not always thinking with a lot of foresight about, like, what happens after, and, like, you know, like, maybe you should have a plan for those babies, but, um, you know, it's really fun, and, and something that I like about fostering different species is that I like to show people you don't have to be an expert to be able to help. Like I'm not a duck expert at all, but I'm interested in trying, you know, sure. and, and just by virtue of being interested in trying, you can learn a lot and you can, you can make a difference. And so sure. that's one reason that I like showing that side of my life because, um, you know, so many people 
see what I do with kittens and they go, well, you can do that because you're like a kitten expert. I'm like, yeah, but I didn't become a kitten expert overnight. Like, you know, and you don't have to be an expert. Oh my gosh. If kittens only could go be with people who have 10 years of kitten experience, I mean, Uh, no one would have any, right? Yeah. We would, we need people, you know, we need people who are not experienced to get involved. And, you know, so um, yeah, I just feel, I feel passionately about helping any baby who needs me because all babies of different species, they all have similar needs. They all need they to be warm. They need to be kept safe. They need to be fed frequently, you know. So um, you have ducklings and you have kittens. Any, any other kind right now? Or what have you done that's the most outrageous species you've helped that no one would uh, think? Well, when I lived in North Carolina, I used to help squirrels. Um, but here I don't do wildlife, California, um, you know, I'm not the laws yeah. not in California to do wildlife, but, um, my favorite is piglets. I love fostering They're piglets so cute. Them. and then since quarantine, I've done three puppies, which that's a handful. To be honest, I wouldn't recommend it. No. <laughs> I know, I love them, but I'm always like puppies remind me of why I love working with kittens. <laughs> My mom has seven dogs, so uh, I, I know when I go to her house, it's just a whole new ball game. When I come home, I'm like, I'll take my 19 cats over her seven dogs any day. A lot of work. Them, but I don't want to own them. Yeah, I love I love dogs, and I love I love working with puppies, but it's um it's really different. I think it is. You know, and this goes to show there's really something for everyone because, you know, if, if cats are not for you, well, you're probably not listening to this if cats are not for you, <laughs> but, <True>. uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, there's, there really is something for everyone, mm-hmm. whether, you know, if you want to foster, um, or you want to get involved, but you're not interested in neonatal kittens, you could do senior cats, you could do dogs, you could do puppies, you can do, guinea pigs you can do ducklings you know you can do horses like there's there's something for absolutely everybody uh, and, and fostering is so important i had um tina reddington with the aspca on I my show her. i love tina yeah i love her um I've, I've re- i also had someone from best friends organization on my show and i did those shows back to back and they seemed like they could have been one show because the the main theme was we need fosters how can people get more involved in fostering i think a lot of people are scared of fostering well right now is a great time to get involved in fostering i think most people are spending a little bit more time indoors right now Mm -hmm. uh, which means that we have more time to dedicate to a foster animal um fostering is something that absolutely anybody can do you don't have to have experience um you can learn um, if people are interested, I do have on my website, a whole, um, guide to getting started. If you go to kittenlady.org slash find kittens, I'll tell you like where you can find kittens and your, I love it and how you can get started. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, I would say watch the webinar series. Honestly, the Royal Canaan webinar series that I did is like my favorite thing I've ever put out online. Um, eight hours of content. So it's a lot. You can find the webinar that applies to you. So you can watch the bottle babies one. You can watch, there's one about weaned kittens. There's one about working with kittens with, you know, health conditions. And then there's the one about working with feral kittens. Um, and you'll learn so much, um, in that. And, you know, you don't have to like reinvent the wheel. You can learn from other people. Um, if you're interested in fostering, I would say, you know, reach out to your local, shelters and rescue groups ask them what kind of support they offer um you know get some supplies if you go to kittenlady.org slash supplies i have like a list of all of the supplies that i use and recommend um and that is you know a helpful place to just figure out like okay what kind of like play pen should i get like do i what do i need oh i need baby blankets if i'm doing neonatal kittens sure i'll get that you know um but yeah, it's a, it's a joyful thing. And you know that you're making an impact. And for me, I think the biggest, you know, the biggest personal gain aside from the, you know, the, what's great for the animals, you know, saving the animal's life is that I think during this time where so many of us feel very like we are just, it's a difficult time for everybody right, right now. It is. I think 
for me, it's so empowering to be able to work on like a short term project, like fostering, you know, maybe a two month project where you can witness a transformation right in front of you and know that you're the one who made that happen. Like that's, that's like the most healing and powerful thing in my life is seeing, seeing that like when I wake up in the morning, the, uh, the choices that I make can actually transform somebody's life. It's a very powerful thing that will, it'll impact you on so many levels. You're not even, you're not even expecting, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful thing to do. Uh, I'm considering fostering some kittens and everybody who knows me is going, no, because they know when I take in an adult, once they cross my threshold, they don't leave because my cats are so loving and they just, they all become one loving community. And I'm like, why would I pull them out of here? But I know with kittens, I could let them go because they've not been through the trauma. They've not been in a home, out of a home, in a home, out of a home. You know, I know I could part with them. Yeah. So well, what I always better. say my like saying that I always say is goodbye is the goal. Um, so when it comes to kittens, uh, the entire goal of fostering kittens is to get them to a place where they're independent enough that you can say goodbye to them. Right. And trust me, if you're anything like me, it'll be hard. No, once they're, once they're eight weeks old, I'm mm-hmm. like, okay, you're healthy, you're crazy, <laughs> you're like running around my house, and like it's been fun, but like goodbye is the goal, like time to you know say bye bye. Yeah, that um, kitten energy is a lot. <laughs> it is, and and you know for me, my goal is to save as many lives as possible and to heal animals who are you know in need of of that kind of support kittens who are you know going through health conditions that they cannot recover from without without assistance right Um, so once they're independent once they're healthy once they're like in a place where anybody could handle them i'm like you don't need me anymore why are you still here like i'm gonna start charging you rent if you keep hanging around like (laughs) you gotta get out of here so that's the attitude I take. And of course I still, I do like get emotional when they leave, but it's, it's not a sad emotional. It's like, right. it's honestly happy emotional. You know, it's like a graduation where you, right. you're emotional because you're like, we did it. You know, I could see that. Definitely. Yeah. We need to take another little sponsor break, but when we come back, let's talk about some of the fun parts of fostering cats and maybe some amusing stories. I'm sure you have some. So we'll, we'll be right back after this break. You don't want to miss what's next. And we're back with 19 Cats and Counting and the awesome Hannah Shaw, the one and only kitten lady. Um, I don't know if any of you have read Tiny But Mighty, but I would definitely recommend taking that book and giving it a good read if you want to know all about kittens. So Hannah, tell me some of the amusing parts of fostering kittens and getting them ready to fly on their own. Oh my gosh. I mean, everything, everything about it is so just fun and joyful for the most part. Now I would say that like, you know, when I take in kittens, there's often a struggle for the first little bit because usually they're coming in not in great condition, Mm -hmm. but then you get to celebrate every little milestone that they make. So like, you know, celebrating the first time that they actually like start playing, you know, and, and seeing their like eyes get big and their back arch and like, Ooh, like they see a toy for the first time. And, you know, it's just like, it's so fun to watch them go through these stages of development and to sure. know that like you made that difference. Um, gosh, what are some of the cutest things about I mean right now I have a bunch of three and a half week old foster kittens which to me is the cutest age it's like the between three and four weeks like so much happens um so when you're fostering like newborn neonates you know they're like a little jelly bean they sleep all day and then right around like three and a half weeks they their vision rapidly starts to improve so they can start seeing things and like tracking objects in the environment um their coordination improves, not like fully. They still kind of like stumble around. Wobbly a little bit. Yeah, but they but they can like walk and even start like trying to pounce and stuff. And 
that age, they are just like a little bobblehead. They're like the cutest thing you've ever seen in your life. Um, yeah. So I always like cherish this this age of kitten. I love having them. It's like being a mom. You really feel that love. Yes. Little guys. Yes, definitely. Yeah, I'm extremely maternal with my kittens. I have like, you know, I think a lot more in common with my mom, my mom friends um, than you would think because it's so I understand. stuff. It's like, mm -hmm. I'm over here with my baby wipes, wiping butts all day, you know? So, um, yeah. My friend Linda, she's, she's a mom and a cat mom and a dog mom. Um, and she's always telling me, don't let anyone ever tell you you're not a mom because you are. A lot of the th same things you go through with kittens, on a smaller scale, you go through with human children, or so I'm told. Right. Yeah. I've been able to give advice to some of my friends, even where they're like my friends who have children and they're like, how do you sleep when you like have a newborn baby? I'm like, well, you know, I can give them some tips about, cause I'm, I often don't sleep through the night cause I'm taking wow. care of babies overnight. You know, they need so, to eat every two hours or so. Right. If they're a newborn. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, I've, I've really like adjusted my lifestyle to kind of just be like 24, seven, three, six, five kitten mom. <laughs> and you know, you can totally do it. You also don't have to go as hard as I do with it. I mean, this is like my entire life. Um, I understand. But, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you can do it. It's my entire life too. So I, I totally understand what, um, what surprised you the most when you started taking care of little, the little ones, especially the young babies. You know, I think, I mean, honestly, what surprised me the most was when I first got started, I just didn't know that shelters couldn't care for young kittens. Mm -hmm. Um, I assumed that they probably were okay in shelters and, and that's just not, um, definitely 10 years ago was not the case. Um, mm -hmm. now I would say there's more and more foster programs, um, that are, you know, helping save lives. But um, I think that's the thing that most people don't know is that mm -hmm. in an animal shelter, you know, they have operating hours, they close at the end of the day, sure. they're not there overnight to take care of kittens. So right. like, literally, when a kitten comes into the shelter, if they're like a three week old kitten, it, it's not even ethical for them to leave them there overnight, they have to have somewhere to go. Um, and that's why these do remain, you know, the most vulnerable animals in terms of cats and shelters, just because they, they have to have somewhere to go. Otherwise there is no other, there is no other solution for them. So right. um, that's the thing that I think surprised me the most and made me feel the most uh, committed to solving that particular problem. Um, what else surprises me about kittens? I mean, they do funny things every single day. Something that a lot of people don't know that I think is just precious is, you know, every kitten is basically born feral. Um, you know, they're born, every single kitten is born not knowing what a human is. Sure. So, uh, when they first are a newborn and when you first get them, a lot of them will hiss even when their eyes are still closed. <laughs> yeah, I've <laughs> seen that. <laughs> I think that is just the cutest, like a little gummy hiss with no teeth and like their eyes closed. It's just the cutest thing in the world. And then obviously they socialize in like 13 seconds when they're that age. Um, but yeah, that, that I think was a surprise to me too. I didn't, I didn't know that when I first got started. And wow, they're so adorable. I, I, I don't know how to bottle feed. Luckily, I know a lady here in the Carolinas through the Kitten Coalition that- Susan? Uh, yeah, Susan Cooksey yeah. Spaulding. How did you know? She um, I know all the kitten people. people. <laughs> uh, I figured you would. So um, back when we can move around again, I definitely want to learn how to bottle feed. Was, was that something that was difficult for you to learn? Were you nervous about it? No, I've been doing that for like over a decade now. So back when I was, you know, back in my day, <laughs> you, there was not anything to teach you how to do that. You just kind of yeah. had to figure it out. You could talk to other people. Like I learned a lot through just meeting people. And that's why I know like every kitten person in the country. Cause I feel like. I had a feeling like, you would know her, especially since yeah, she's in the no, Carolinas. Susan, Susan's awesome. She does great work. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I think 10, 11 years ago, it was like, you better know somebody who knows something. And right. um, I, that's why I started my project Kitten Lady with a focus on humane education, because I don't want anybody to feel like they don't have someone they can go to, you know, and that's sure. why 
So I have a YouTube channel that's filled with, um, you know, educational videos. You can watch, you can learn how to bottle feed. You can watch the webinars. You can get the book, Tiny But Mighty, which is like over 300 pages of kitten care information. Oh. And that did not exist when I got started. And that I'm still working on every single day. All I do is wake up and start thinking about, okay, what's the next educational resource that I can create yeah. so that people don't have to feel alone. Cause like this one, like <laughs> I love, I love this book. Yeah. Love, that's my kid's I, book. I'd hold up the other one, but I have that on my Kindle. It, I think it's so important, Anna, that we teach the kids Mm -hmm. uh, about not just kittens but all animals and how precious yeah. their little lives are because some some kids aren't raised in homes with with animals and really don't know how to handle them yeah you know i think compassion is something that m almost every kid is born with compassion for animals sure and then unfortunately just by virtue of like the world that we live in it's like they sort of are are conditioned not to care about animals the older that they get, you know? And I mm -hmm. think there's a lot, there's a lot of things that go into that. Um, I think it's so important that we're modeling for young people that compassion is a cool thing, right. that it's for everyone. It's not just for like girls, you know, like if you can like the whole cat, cat lady thing just needs to go away because that's the harming cats. You know, we want everybody of all genders to feel like they can be involved in cats. Um, you know, so I think um, it's really, really important to me that kids see that it's, it's awesome to be involved in animal welfare. And I think a lot of kids naturally love animals. Yeah. But they're oh, they do. Sure, they're not sure necessarily what to do with that love. So right. Um, you know, that's why I made the book that you just held up, Kitten Lady's mm -hmm. Big Book of Little Kittens, is um, to have some information out there for kids who are interested in animal welfare. Because when I was growing up, I had cat books, but they were more like about, you know, like all the different breeds of cats. And it's like, that's not what we need to be teaching kids. Like, no. Kids about fostering, about Great. shelters, about community cats. And you know, I have to say, even on my like YouTube channel, like the majority of my audience is young, like really young people. Um, right now I'm doing an interview series um, that is a continuation of the Royal Canaan Catology series I was doing. Um, it's called Kitten Lady and Friends. And I'm mm -hmm. interviewing like experts from all sorts of different parts of cat welfare. And uh, the chat is always like kids. It's awesome. I mean, kids are I really love interested that. in it. And uh, they are. I have to think things are going to be better 10 years from now than they are today. So I think they will. I know Linda, my business partner and best friend, um, her son, Cameron, he's 15. He's, he loves all animals, but he's particularly in love with cats. And he has a chat board in our, in our cat, catitude club club catitude so that we can have something that speaks to the teens and speaks to the kids on their level mm -hmm. um i know one of the things we'd like to do is get into the schools to do some you know outreach and uh feline education for the kids mm -hmm. and i would be taking your book with me <laughs> okay. well, i reinvent the wheel it's right here my my other friend uh arden moore i don't know if you know arden she's the pet safety expert she's also written uh both a cat and a dog book that are towards the kids you know oh. So there's more of that out there, which I love to see. And uh, of course, I will be checking out your series too. Um, I always tell people the more you can learn about cats, the better. So I promote your books. I'll promote Arden's, you know, Jackson's books, Pam, Johnson, Bennett. Every, I think if you want to know about cats, you really need to read everybody's books to get a sure. more well-rounded perspective. And of course, when people come to me asking about kittens, I always send them to you and your website oh, and your books. Yeah. I appreciate that. Well, you're the expert there, so um, you know more about kittens than I could ever hope to know, I'm sure. And I'm sure you still learn things every day, something surprises Listen, you. Listen, anyone who tells you they know everything is lying. Agree. No one knows everything. <laughs> I feel like what I know is just a little sliver. And, Me too. Um, you know, and every single every single atom of that sliver is made to be shared. I think knowledge is definitely made to be shared. And Agreed. every time I learn something new, 
I share it. Um, you know, I want, I want everybody to be able to learn together because goodness knows, like, it's not fun to go through this stuff alone. No. Um, so that's why also I feel really passionately about taking on like kind of unique cases, things that I, I actually celebrate and look for cases uh, that I don't know anything about because it's what helps me learn. Like recently sure. I did, um, a kitten who had congenital hypothyroidism, which is very rare in kittens. Um, and I was like so excited to, to work on that case because I was like, wow, all the knowledge that can be gained from this. I was working sure. with UC Davis and was participating in a study um, with a researcher there uh, because, you know, so much of the time with these little kittens, they have these congenital conditions, um, these, you know, diseases that they're born with. <laughs> where they may just, you know, pass away and we never get to learn anything from them. And so we don't even have like the knowledge and research to know what to do when these situations come up. So oh, I feel sure. really passionately about trying to solve those problems and then sharing that information so other people can see, you know, it really is possible to save even the most vulnerable of lives. Oh, sure. I, um, I wrote a book called Sadie's Heart about my heart cat, Sadie. Mm -hmm. And when I adopted her as a kitten, she had ventral septal defect. It was very severe. Mm -hmm. And they told me that those cats, of course, this was, you know, 20 years ago. They told me those cats are usually euthanized and they suggested mm -hmm. I euthanize her. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. So I pushed my veterinarians to find treatments and find, you know, different ways to administer her heart medications that she would tolerate. Long story short, she lived to be almost seven, which... Mm -hmm which uh, every vet that saw her would say to me, how is this cat alive? Wow. But I just wish that I had had the opportunity to have that be more of a learning experience for the veterinary community than it was. Mm. But I'm honored that she was able to live as long as she did be because I pushed the veterinarian, you know, to, no, she's, I'm not putting her, her down and we're going to find ways to make her feel comfortable. So I'm like you, I, I like a challenge. I like an underdog. Most of the cats I've brought in, if they didn't have personality and behavior issues, they have some physical issue. I have a three-legged cat. You know, I've, my mom's the same way with the dog. So I'm, I'm all for the underdog. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that you you probably did teach the vets a lot through that experience because I hope. It's, only, it's only people like me and you who are willing <laughs> to go down that path who give vets the opportunity to learn how to work with these more vulnerable cases um, so I think it is, uh, very important and it's a, it's a weekly occurrence in my life that I'm explaining to a vet, no, no, we are going to continue <laughs> with this and yes, we will be treating and, um, you know, you can, you will blow yourself away with how much you can do when you approach life with that kind of attitude, you know, and okay. I think that spills out into everything else, like just having the attitude of hope having the attitude that a positive outcome is possible. Um, and then that, that allows you to see where the line really is. You know, you're like, sure. okay, if I think this, ho this is a potentially hopeful situation, then it gives you the, the space to be able to create a positive outcome. And then for me, that's my whole worldview is informed by that. You know, I don't know how I would even get through this time if that was not the way that I <laughs> thought I about things, you know, but I do I have to say, um, you know, right now there's a, there's a campaign called the take your cat to the vet campaign, um, which I am extremely passionate about because. Oh, yes. I, I had Maya on and she's involved in that. Yeah. 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 She and I did a PSA together about it. I have it. Um, it is a really important campaign um, because more than half of cats in the United States don't get regular vet care. So a lot of these conditions, you know, like the septal defect you mentioned, like people might not even know that their cat is suffering silently and going through mm -hmm. something. So um, very important call to action for people to remember to schedule regular vet care for your cat, make sure that they're, you know, up to date on um, you know, any preventative care, make sure that they're getting seen regularly, um, sure. you know, really, really important. The biggest pushback I get from that for, is people that say, oh, I can't get my cat in the carrier. And I, you know, she's too hard. Well, there's ways around that too. I have a home vet and I have two office vets. 
because you can't, the home vet can't do everything, but they can at least give the exam, maybe identify an issue that needs to be seen in an office. And the other thing too, just keep the carrier out, let your cats play in it. I have such an easier time getting them in the carrier because for them, it's become a play in a safe space rather than, sure. uh-oh, here's the carrier, I'm going to the vets. Yeah, right? if your carrier only comes out when they go get like poked with a needle, then yeah, they're not gonna like the carrier. Um, but absolutely, I agree 100% with your advice, like leave the carrier open, put some treats in it every once in a while so it's like a fun place to go explore. Um, and then it's, it's not so bad. And the other thing that I'm a big fan of is fear-free vets. Um, you know, we go to a, the vet that we use here is a fear-free certified vet, which means mm -hmm. that, um, you know, they are trained to make that as stress-free of a situation as possible for the cats. So it's, it's a really wonderful thing. I always tell people if you're, if you're worried about stress with your cats, you know, first do the carrier thing you just mentioned. And then second, right. go to a fear-free vet or a cat, like a specialty cat vet specialty. that just works with cats. Right. Um, because they're going to be a lot more knowledgeable. It, it is stressful if your cat's just going to like any old vet that just has like barking dogs everywhere. And I know. they don't know how to work with cats that well, you know. Um, so go to a cat, go to a cat vet or, and or go to a fear-free vet. Um, you'll have a great experience. I agree. So um, anything that we haven't covered that you want to make sure we get out there? Oh my gosh. Well, I could talk to you forever. Um, I guess <laughs> well, I you'll you can come back too. <laughs> I want to mention, um, you know, if people are interested in learning more about the Take Your Cat to the Vet campaign, they can go, um, the website is royalcanon.com slash cat health. And on there, you can, you can find a lot of great information, but, but my favorite thing you can do on there is actually get a free online vet consult. Um, so people who are worried right now during COVID, if they're right. not able to access vet care, at least, at least do the online consultation. Right. That's going to be um, really, really good to just make sure that you're, you're, you know, seeking some kind of veterinary advice. Um, but there's a lot of great info on there. And then, you know, the other thing that people can do right now is watch my ongoing Kitten Lady and Friends series. Um, so I hope people will check that out. That's just, if you go to my YouTube channel is youtube.com slash kitten lady and awesome. all there hundreds of videos. I love it. And I will include all this information in the accompanying blog that I will write about this show. Oh. Thank you so much for coming. I would love to have you on again in the future. Uh, keep me appraised of any upcoming um, initiatives you're working on. I, I would love to keep abreast of everything you're doing. Um, you. And many thanks to Mark Winter, who does such an awesome job producing my show. And my continued thoughts to my friend and business partner, Linda Hall, as she and her family continue their recovery from COVID. And remember, everybody, the most important thing, every day is Catter Day. See you next time.